Hello everybody. Today we're talking about Maknovia or Maknovitia, if you want it to be harder to pronounce. It was a movement that controlled substantial areas in Ukraine during the Russian Civil War. What makes this group unique is that they were one of the only attempts to establish practical anarchism with socialist features in history. And arguably the first one if you're willing to brand the Paris Commune as counter-revolutionary bad guys. In this video we will go over how the Russian Civil War and the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk led to the conditions for Maknovia to form the way Makhno, the guy who is its name after, became the sort of ruler of an anarchist society that was definitely not meant to have rulers. I will explain how the region organized itself, how the economy worked and how it defended itself before exploring what ultimately led to its demise. Naturally, since we're going to talk about an anarchist movement, it's not always easy to use the right words. Because they were a collection of loosely organized communes, words like government, state, nation and even leader, depending on how you use it, are just wrong. So I will try to avoid them as best as I can. If I make any mistakes, please gently inform me about them in the comment section. If you want to know all of the things about Magnovia, which I had to cut for time, I recommend you watch my content creator stream on the second channel, which is linked in the pinned comment. And if you would like to learn more about political and historical topics from a leftist point of view, I recommend you subscribe because I upload videos like this every Sunday with the exception of next week because you can't make me make a video when I have three Christmas celebrations to attend within the same week. As with about half of my recent videos, the story here begins once again during the First World War and the Russian Revolution. It's almost as if these events determined the future of leftism around the world or something. Basically, the Russian Empire was in World War I and they arrested socialists and anarchists. But then the middle class overthrew the Tsar and the government they set up didn't end the world war. So the Bolsheviks and friends overthrew the new government establishing the Russian Socialist Federative Republic and later the Soviet Union. Naturally there were many people in the former Russian Empire that did not like the new Bolshevik government, chiefly the so-called White Army which had so many different leaders and goals that I can't even oversimplify their general beliefs besides that they really didn't like Lenin and his party and they started a civil war to overthrow them. For the sake of not meeting the same fate as the government Lenin just overthrew, he decided to end Russian involvement in World War I. Which was of course also because Lenin needed his armies in the civil war and couldn't expend energy fighting the Germans. So they signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which made Russia give up huge amounts of land, chiefly in Ukraine and Belarus. So naturally, the Germans and Austrians started to occupy the region militarily to get all of the grain there. Because the central powers were blockaded by the Entente at this point, and they ran out of food. The occupation immediately caused lots of armed uprisings against them. They were Ukrainian nationalists, Bolshevik loyalists, anarchists, left socialists and of course the anti-Bolshevik white armies which didn't even recognize the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Eventually in November of 1918 Germany would capitulate and the occupation of the former Russian lands ended. Along with this came a power vacuum in Ukraine, especially in the eastern regions which had no large industry and were mostly rural farming communities. So some people set up a new Soviet Republic aligned with Lenin. Others formed the Green Army, which whole goal was to not take part in the fighting. And there were nationalist forces. And of course, the White Army was in the region. And others yet again tried their hand at establishing a new society based on Bakunin's and Kropotkin's ideas of anarchism. A lot of these factions agreed on one thing, councils, sometimes called Soviets. The people would be part of councils of workers or peasants or soldiers and these councils had local control over small areas like a factory for example. Then from these councils higher level councils were formed to represent all smaller councils. These regional councils were called 
Volosts, but I will call them communes because they pretty much were and I can pronounce that easier. Crucially, these communes were not ruled by representatives, but by delegates. The difference is that a representative is elected and sent to a council and then they do whatever they want to, even if it goes against the will of their voters. They have a set amount of length they serve. A delegate, on the other hand, can be recalled at any time. So going against the will of the people just once means the people replace them. This is very important for anarchism. The whole reason anarchists believe that central governments are oppressive is because they assert that representatives can never truly represent the people. After all, even if you are a worker and you have the same interests as all the workers, like low labor tax, once you are in parliament, suddenly your interests are no longer that, because now you live a different life to a worker. And as someone running the government, it's now in your interest to heighten taxes and lessen political participation of the people to help you keep your job. Of course, you can't just hope that representatives will be idealistic enough to go against their immediate self-interest for the sake of their voters, but anarchists aren't willing to take chances, so they use delegates to keep the ruling councils accountable. But, of course, even with these councils, the communes weren't working together too well when it came to matters like defense. In steps Nestor Magno. He was one of those people who were imprisoned by the Tsar for being an anarchist, and he was released after the revolution. Naturally, he returned to his hometown in what today is Ukraine, then unionized all of the farmers and took the land from the landowners and gave it to peasants. The landowners couldn't really protest because they were outnumbered, and by this stage Ukraine basically had no government to keep track of who owned what land, so they couldn't exactly call the police to tear gas the peasants. Then Magno joined the Black Guards, which is an anarchist version of the Red Guard. They had a central leadership and purged those who they deemed to have the wrong beliefs, as Mother Anarchy would want. Eventually, Magno became their leader, before they were disarmed by the Bolshevik secret police named the Cheka. As I mentioned before, all central leadership in Ukraine fell apart once the Germans moved out. So there were many armies who didn't know who to listen to anymore. Many went over to the Soviets, some went over to the Whites, and large parts went over to the anarchists like Magno. And some others opted to become warlords who often changed their allegiances. Magno emphasized the need for the anarchist regions to unite for the purpose of defense. And he helped organize the first congress, which we will come back to later. Magno collected willing recruits and eventually united them with the units that went over to his side and those left over from the Black Guards, who then all worked together to form the Revolutionary Insurrectionary Army of Ukraine, also called the Black Army or Magnovci. Magno set up his headquarter in his hometown and established a work program. As anarchists tend to do, Magno really didn't like the Bolsheviks or the Red Army, so he called them dictators, and he strongly opposed the Cheka, who were basically a proto-KGB. Naturally, there were to be elections for the councils in the anarchist territories, and Bolsheviks could be freely voted for. On the other hand, in Bolshevik areas, anarchists couldn't even run for election, which naturally put the anarchists on a bit of a disadvantage. Magno then banned the Cheka in all areas his Black Army controlled and banned anyone there from joining them. The Bolsheviks said that this is laughable because Magno had his own secret police which he had no issue with. Whether that is actually true is still a subject to debate, though the concept of an anarchist secret police seems like an amazing oxymoron, so I sort of want it to be true. Possibly the secret police was so secret that Magno himself didn't even know it existed. While Magno tried to establish a society along anarchist guidelines, he was suddenly attacked by the White Army from the South. At this time, the Black Army had about 20,000 members, and sadly that wasn't enough, and within three days, the White Armies had pushed Magno 
outside of his base of operations. So he called upon an unlikely ally, the Bolsheviks, who helped him push the White Army out of Ukraine for good. Well, for the next two years at least. Let's have a look at how Magnovia was organized and how it worked before looking at what exactly stopped it from existing until today. The Bolsheviks. It was the Bolsheviks. In accordance with anarchist ideas, the anarchist region, which, by the way, called itself the Free Territory, was organized around a system of councils. Every worker and every peasant was part of one of these councils, which would decide issues in the interests of the peasants. And these councils would send delegates to the commune council, which decided on matters that affected the whole commune. In general, the communes all attempted to create an anarchist society to the best of their ability, and they all went about it in different ways. Almost all turned factories into collectives run by workers' councils, and they pretty much all redistributed land from the landowners and gave it to the peasants, as communists do. In general, though not everywhere, these communally owned factories and farms would use a free market to exchange resources. I'm sure the free territory would have abandoned markets eventually, and some communes already did, but they were clearly willing to use a market-style system for a period of time, meaning until they figured out a better system. Eventually, the anarchist communes and councils held a very big congress to determine their united goals. Yes, the same one I just talked about in a previous section. It was made up of about 400 delegates from all of the local communes, as well as some delegates from the Black Army units, because they also got their own councils. The first congress was focused on the threats the free territory was facing, and that was underground organizations led by Ukrainian nationalists that wanted to destroy the Black Army. They decided that the best way forward was to establish anti-nationalist propaganda all across the territory. Which, like, I'm not sure how compatible that is with anarchist ideas, but I guess if a congress decides on it, it's fine. At the same congress, they decided on five points to express the purpose of the free territory and the congress, as well as their goals. They said there could be no political parties, no form of dictatorships, no central state, no transitional period like Lenin talked about, and there had to be complete self-determination of the people through councils. The second congress was even more focused on external threats. Remember when I said that the white army attacked the free territory? This was now. The congress quickly decided that they needed to bolster defense. The black army under Magno was tasked with this. They established voluntary military service. Despite a lot of people wanting to join Magno and his prestigious army, most couldn't be accepted because they straight up didn't have the guns to arm them. And sources disagree on whether military service in the free territory was actually voluntary. A bunch of historians say that the people were pressured and forced to take part in the fighting, and others say that this never happened and the Black Army only accepted genuine volunteers. This is of course an important question, because if they actually forcefully conscripted people, well, then their anarchism past should be revoked. Personally, I think they did not use conscription. Not because I think that they were a perfect anarchist society or because I think they were above that, but because of what one of their enemies said. Leon Trotsky. He said that the free territory is weak and can be easily conquered because they have no conscription. Trotsky saw them as enemies. He had no reason to lie to make them look like genuine anarchists. So he is probably being truthful and they did rely on volunteers. After deciding that voluntary conscription was definitely going to save them from the approaching white army, the congress went about making enemies in high places. They said that every state is bad, including the Soviet state, and the Russian Socialist Federal Republic is 
oppressing peasants, the government is appointing committees without accountability that fuck everyone over. The Bolsheviks are just using the slogan of dictatorship of the proletariat to get rid of their enemies and so on. Basically every anarchist's critique of the early Soviet Union. So far, the Black Army and the Free Territory had been very different in their organization. While the anarchist regions tried their best to run everything in accordance with anarchist ideas, the Black Army was basically like any other army. Central command, appointed and not elected officers, and general authoritarian stuff like that. So the Second Congress tried to change it. They set up a regional military revolutionary council that would lead the army from then on. It was made up of representatives of the communes in the region and representatives from all rebel units. This council would be the organ that would organize military action in and around the free territory. Sadly, the voluntary expansion of the Black Army did not prove enough and the whites sort of came in and took half the free territory, including the headquarters of the military and the meeting place of the Congress, within one week. So the military council, which by the way was unofficially led by Magno, asked the Soviets for help. The idea was that the Soviets would provide military support against their common enemy and nothing else. They were not supposed to touch the self-determination of the communes. The Soviets did not care and immediately banned the anarchists from holding another congress. Unfortunately, if you tell an anarchist not to do something, there is a great chance that they will do exactly that. So they held a congress. When the Red Army showed up to fight the Whites, they set up their own workers' councils in the Free Territory, organized the same way the councils in the rest of the USSR were, and de facto under Bolshevik control, along with the representatives for these councils. Yes, representatives, not delegates. Shocking. So the Congress immediately said that these representatives were stupid and that they were all fired, there had to be elections to decide who should hold these positions as delegates in the future and so on. They also said how the Bolshevik party is stupid and all parties are stupid and no state should exist, as you would expect. Now de facto being under control of the government in Moscow, they set up their own councils as a sort of dual power resistance movement which saw no success. Now you may be wondering what Magno was actually doing. The congresses and councils had no leaders, so that wasn't his job, but what was? Well, running the army pretty much. At first because he was the commander and later because the soldiers kept electing him to lead them. He was a very charismatic and liked figure in the free territory. He was also always among the people who organized the congresses. And the average person really considered him a hero. He is often called Batko Magno, which means Father Magno. The people loved him, so despite not having official leaders, he was often seen as a representative for all free territories in Ukraine. However, the free territory never called itself Magnovia, because that would mean land of Magno, and they didn't see it that way. To them, the councils and the congresses were in charge of everything, not Magno. They liked him, but they wouldn't exactly make him president. They had no president. That is the whole point of establishing this anarchist society. But to all forces outside of the region, like the Red and White armies, they didn't even recognize the councils as a legitimate form of governance. They saw the free territory as a place without law and order and without control. To them, the Black Army was the only thing ruling that region. They just couldn't accept an anarchist form of governance to be as legitimate as their own rule. So they named the region after the guy who ran the military, which unlike the communes, they respected as a political force. So it became Magnovia. And the term is used so much that most don't even know that it is based on a lack of understanding of how the free territory worked. So then, now we know how the anarchist region worked. Let's come to how it failed. As mentioned before, 
the red army supporting the black army against the white army ushered in a period of something like dual power. There were two groups claiming to be in power and to be the rightful leaders of the territory. As mentioned before, the anarchist congress kept speaking out against the Soviets, saying basically everything an anarchist doesn't like about Marxist-Leninists. As such, the attitude of the Soviet government began to shift. They began to blockade arms shipments to the region, and their propaganda from Petrograd started calling the Congress and Magno kulaks, which means landowner, quite an insult to a leftist. Then the Free Territory held a new Congress, saying the Bolshevik party is illegitimate and stinky and that they aren't even running a dictatorship of the proletariat at all and they're just power hungry. By 1919, the Russian Civil War was pretty much at its end point. The Red Army was 5 million strong, while the White Army was 1 million. The Soviets had basically won, so they began to re-evaluate their relationship with the smaller factions like the Left Socialist Republic, the Green Army, and yes, the Black Army and the Free Territory. The Soviets had unlike these factions or left them alone just because they didn't want to make new enemies. But now that they practically got rid of the White Army, they increasingly started to be hostile to these smaller factions. After all, these factions did not bow to the central government. So in the eyes of the Bolshevik party, they were rebelling against the dictatorship of the proletariat. So the Bolsheviks ramped up the propaganda. They said that the free territory was not organized anarchism, but just a region of warlords. They said Magno handpicked the leadership and that they weren't elected at all. That Magno tortured and executed political opponents that he was a dictator using a secret police, and they even blamed some terrorist attacks on him. All of these accusations were based on nothing. But there are still people today repeating these unconfirmed accusations to discredit the entire free territory and the black army. Then the unthinkable happened. Despite the Bolshevik government saying they can't, the anarchists held a new congress. This caused Lenin to declare all members of the Congress criminals and ordered their arrest. Because there was not exactly Bolshevik police in the Free Territory, and because they knew the Black Army was armed and not likely to comply, they sent in the Red Army to make the arrests. Naturally, the anarchist leaders, who were just declared criminals, agreed that this constituted a Soviet invasion of the Free Territory. So they mobilized the army and when the Red Army came to Ukraine, they heroically retreated and gave up half of their communes without a fight. Which seems like a questionable tactic, but when they suddenly turned around and engaged the Red Army, the Red Army was so surprised that the Black Army defeated them and took back all of the land they just lost. Then there was a truce, because there was still a white army in the south of Ukraine, and they fought it together. But as soon as the White Army was defeated, the Bolsheviks, who really outnumbered the Black Army, completely changed objective. They were going to destroy the Free Territory. But instead of just fighting, they did something different. They invited all Black Army leaders to the Red Army meeting discussing the civil war. And when they showed up, they were all arrested and executed. Magno managed to escape in time, though. He tried to set up a resistance movement with the remnants of the Black Army, but the Red Army was significantly stronger in numbers, in equipment, in experience, so it was all in vain. By mid-1921, the Free Territory was just another part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, with all anarchists being imprisoned or executed and the communes dissolved or made part of the Soviet state. Magno managed to flee to exile and he lived in France until his death. The writings of the late Magno are very interesting. Among other things, he invented platformism, if you know what that is. And if you don't, it's basically a way to keep an anarchist movement unified by only accepting those who fully agree. This group would then try to influence the people and society towards anarchist ideals. This may sound like a vanguard party, but platformists say it's not one. So, you know? In conclusion, 
Magnovia was born from the conditions created at the end of the First World War. It attempted to reach anarcho-communism in many ways. They organized the free territory very decentrally and made many economic changes for the benefit of the people. But on the other hand, despite being anarchists, they still had a de facto leader called Magno, who had full control over the army, which is not too anarchist. The region was allied with the Soviets for the purpose of fighting the conservative forces, but as soon as the Red Army won the civil war, they turned on the Black Army and destroyed it, taking over the region under the control of a Soviet Republic, causing everlasting hatred between Leninists and anarchists for uncounted generations to come. Thank you very much for watching until the end. It seems like you liked this video. So you may enjoy my whole channel. There is a playlist linked on screen in a moment if you want to see more or alternatively just subscribe and watch the weekly videos I make every Sunday. Except for next Sunday because I want a Christmas break. So Merry Christmas to all who celebrate it, Happy Holidays to those who don't and Happy New Year's to everyone. Remember to donate on my Patreon to join my Discord server and I will see you in my content creator stream on my second channel later today, linked in a pinned comment. Or if live streams are not your cup of tea, I will be uploading again as usual on the 2nd of January. Bye! And of course I still need to thank Darius the Bird, Eric Betts, Harris Hawk, V, Sander Corvus, Alexander Parch, Natilla Nemetz, Carissa, Daniel Hyman, Dominic Roselli, DSM-5 is better than ICD-10, Emily Marigold Klassen, Herdina, Jersey, Glastrup, Lilith Craft, Mamuka Tiliari, Marxism Tonight, Nana Epema, Pote, Raymond Deville, Red Shock Trooper, Sean Murphy, Skylar Magnum Turner, Stemmaster Chef, Taylor CH, and Trey.